you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. But that is the primary argument for, well, we need to know everything about everybody so that if something does go wrong, we can find out who did it. Like, well, okay, there's a thing called police work. Do it. I thought that we, the people, were supposed to be private citizens and the government was supposed to be public. Oh yeah, that's not how it works now. If you tell the truth, you get thrown in jail. They have their assets here in this state and the Fed doesn't need to know about that. There's no functional legal nexus other than where you live. So if you live in New York, New York's gonna say that asset is in New York. If you then move to Virginia, now New York can say, well, it was in New York, so we have, we can control it. And Virginia can say, well, you're here, so we can control it. Now, that gets to be a, a problem. The governments of the world want to have absolute visibility into the assets of their citizenry. If you look at the results, I believe they're there to allow them to collect massive taxes from people when uh, the inflation does start to get out of control. It's not really that Bitcoin's on the ballot, it's that freedom's on the ballot. The freedom to choose how we want to store our value, how we want to transact, that's what's really at stake. Sovereignty is on the ballot, right? The, the ability for us to remain a private citizen, as I said, like the government trying to take away our ability to be that private individual. Is that how you see it? Uh, All right, Colin, so um, we were talking about the inner workings and in the belly of the beast uh, uh, and the political fighting that's happening. Uh, specifically, there's a power struggle between states' rights and, mm -hmm. and fed rights. Um, I want to get into that. Um, I want to talk about, you know, what's happening uh, on the political field uh, in terms of th those those fights, as well as what's happening, obviously, with Bitcoin, uh, the right to mine Bitcoin, mm -hmm. those types of things, uh, Bitcoin on the balance sheet of the United States, uh, a lot of stuff to talk about. Um, but we were talking about, um, just before we start recording, I want to jump back into. Um, so. You're in, you work for the Secretary of State, uh, State of Wyoming. Yes. And uh, I was saying how I've registered corporations in the state of Wyoming because of the privacy that it allows. And um, some of that's been lost. Mm. And you were saying that it's not, uh, it wasn't Wyoming's fault. It's the, it's the feds that are putting this in. And now it's going to this uh, Alabama, I think you said, uh, suing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and just uh, fill us in. We'll jump back in on that. Okay, so there's a, a small, a, a business coalition called, I believe it's National Small Business United, sued the federal government and Treasury Secretary Yellen about the FinCEN rule called the Corporate Transparency Act. Uh, and uh, based on the burden that it creates for small businesses, as well as the fact that it's um, uh, potentially or allegedly unconstitutional, the district- And it's unconstitutional because- Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons why they've alleged, but the primary ones are the feds are intruding on an area of, uh, that is traditionally regulated by the states, right. as well as the fact that, um, so the, the feds don't have general or police powers. So when they do regulate inside uh, states, they have to tack it to one of their uh, actual powers. One of them, and the most uh, broad uh, spectrum one, is historically the Commerce Clause. Their argument is that corporations implicitly impact commerce. Well, the alternate argument is inter uh, interstate commerce specifically. When a, uh, a corporation is formed, A, it might not be engaging in commerce at all, and there is no guarantee that it will ever engage in interstate commerce. So their power to demand all of these corporations register at the moment they're formed is uh, that by that argument would be unconstitutional because you're you're forcing them to do something that they that the uh, that the feds don't have the power to force them to do yet. Um, so those are the, those are the two primary arguments in that case. The district court found that the uh, FinCEN rule was unconstitutional, limited it to the parties in the lawsuit. So if you were a member of this group, uh, you don't have to comply with the FinCEN rule right now. Everyone else does but it immediately got appealed to the 11th Circuit and it is pending um, uh, expedited review right now. Hopefully that decision will come down um, before the end of the year because there is a deadline for all existing corporations to register by January 1 of next year. And the, the fines are substantial, something like uh, $5,000 a day. Don't, I'm not 100% sure that's uh, the exact number, but it's, it's a, a very large number. And the cost of compliance is very high. Um, but of course they've exempted large companies. So it's only the ones small that can businesses. afford it. The ones that can afford it don't have to do it. If you are a publicly traded company, if you have more than um, 25 or 50 employees, if you're a bank, if you are uh, a CPA, not a lawyer, lawyers uh, have to do it, but CPAs don't. It's, it's, it's a, a bizarre set of exclusions. Uh, even nonprofits though have to do it. So 
all of these companies have to register immediately, and companies that have pre-existed have until the end of this year to do it. If this case comes down uh, in the way that um, I hope it does, which is this law is declared unconstitutional, then it, it ideally would go away, or at least have to be refactored and fixed, uh, and uh, a lot of the problems would be removed. Yeah. Um, but the costs of compliance are extremely high, and to the extent of they want to know not just who all the beneficial owners are, which is anybody who has an economic interest or controlling interest, doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing at the same time. They also apparently want your succession plan. So if you have, if it's a you know, husband and wife that own like a corner store, they want to know all the personal information about your kids. Which, why do they need to know that today? They, yeah, this, it's it's a KYC all the things mentality. Yeah. Now, you said this is uh, sort of the states' rights versus Fed rights, mm -hmm. but specifically it's more not the Fed, it's FinCEN, which is part of the Treasury that's doing this. Is FinCEN one of the three- and four-letter administrative state agencies, or are they part of the Fed? They are, I, be I believe they are a, uh, well, it's, it's the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, so sure. FinCEN. Uh, I believe they're quasi-governmental. Uh, I'm not entirely sure precisely how they fit in, but effectively they're granted uh, regulatory The reason why I asked that is because of what just happened with the Supreme Court overturning yeah. the Chevron. Chevron is a big and deal. And so they have just basically neutered a lot of these three and four letter agencies, including the EPA mm -hmm. and you know SEC and all these agencies. And so I'm just curious if maybe that has something to do with FinCEN. For the purposes of Chevron uh, and, and its uh, removal in Loper Bright, I believe that uh, that aspect would apply here. It would. It would. So, I, I, to the ex uh, so if FinCEN is analyzing their rules in a way that uh, uh, they should not be granted Chevron deference now that the Chevron case has come down, that doesn't necessarily mean that will change anything. That is an argument that uh, I don't believe was made in the district court, so that could be a new argument that's made. The problem in this case, uh, and I, uh, I have not done this analysis yet, but one of the problems that I see is that Congress very specifically asked them to collect a lot of this information. So there is, uh, unlike, say, Loper Bright, where uh, the enforcement agency just r randomly created this uh, rule that they could collect $700 from fishermen, um, f the, FinCEN, the, the Corporate Transparency Act, or CTA, has a lot more specificity from Congress. So. Mm -hmm. While the, the removal of Chevron would apply, I don't know how valuable that is in this case. That said, it is a definite argument that can be made if the 11th Circuit doesn't find it unconstitutional under the arguments that are already before it. So we could, if, if, if this fails, then potentially there's a, a try it again using yes. a different angle. And there's, a, there's at least uh, there, there's a, a couple of other angles that could be tried even if uh, the Chevron one isn't brought to yeah. bear. So there's, there's several avenues that can be brought still. Yeah. The problem is the, uh, the decision, uh, if it, everything goes into effect on January 1 for the existing businesses. And of course, every business that's been formed since January 1 of this year, they have to comply within 90 days of formation. So uh, to some extent, you know, the, the horses are out of the barn. Yeah. Um, now, in the, EP, in the EIA case, the judge in that case forced the EIA to destroy all the data that they had collected. I don't know or uh, if that is the kind of thing that a judge would demand in this case if it was found that they, the, uh, the FinCEN had violated yeah. some rule. It's, uh, it's on the table, but... Now, um, why? That's the question I want to ask. I, uh, we just saw this week um, the EU mm -hmm. put out a thing. They want an asset registration list, and they want everybody in the EU now to register. I don't know if you saw that. Register every asset they own, including yeah, yeah, like Rolex, Rolex watches and bank accounts and cars and the whole thing. Um, you mentioned this is sort of like a KYC power grab, so to speak. Uh, elaborate on that. I, I believe that part of this is just based on the fact that they want to, the, the, the governments uh, of the world want to have uh, absolute visibility into the assets of their citizenry. Um, partly, uh, they, they'll claim uh, anti-money laundering, they'll claim all of these things, but uh, as, as we as Bitcoiners know, these, these laws do not collect or uh, solve the problems that they're passed to attempt to solve. They fall on normal people 
and they fall on uh, the the costs of enforcement fall on people who aren't otherwise uh, problematic. If you look at the results, I believe they're there to allow them to collect massive taxes from people when uh, the inflation does start to get out of control. They need to they need to pull money out of the system uh, that they've printed. The only way to do that is taxation. Uh, so they need to know where all these assets are. If you're going to implement a wealth tax, you need to know where the wealth is and how much is, how, uh, how much is out there. So similarly to the concept of should we have a registry of everyone's firearms in this country, uh, we see that a lot of us see that as a front to the Second Amendment because as soon as they know where they all are, they can come and get them. Well, if they know where all the wealth is, they can come and get it. If you have to register it. I mean, don't they already know that? They know what's in your bank account, certainly. I mean, um, you have to file, you have to, you have to claim all your assets every year when you file your taxes. You have to claim all of your income, but you don't necessarily have to claim, like, you don't have to claim your Rolex. Right. Uh, you have real estate if you have... Uh, monetary assets monetary assets. And assets that are over certain denominations. And but uh, certain types of things you don't have to, but if they're actually going, and you don't, uh, you have to file a tax return on your company, you do have to um, report that, but the... If your company isn't generating a ton of income, if it's basically a uh, uh, relatively balanced company, like a lot of small LLCs are, uh, mom and pop things where you know maybe the income or a holding company or even a holding company, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of that you know may not provide much detail on the tax return. Now you're going to get not just who owns it, but potentially all possible future owners if they're getting all of this, uh, 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 all of this um, succession information. So they'll know. Now, if you're going to inherit, now they, they could use that information to jack up the inheritance taxes, which you know, that's a, that is a policy argument. That's fine. We can have that argument. But should we, uh, do we need to destroy the last vestiges of uh, whatever we feel is privacy just to get that? And uh, I, I don't think we should do that. Yeah. Do you think it puts, do you think it creates more harm than it does good? It, yes. In the long run, um, well, first of all, you've now created a massive database. It's a honeypot. A honeypot. The, the, That's the problem. You, you, you first have to trust that the government is going to handle the data properly. Uh, that's an open question. I, yeah. I, I don't. I don't necessarily want to go there, but let's assume that the government itself is going to handle the data uh, in a in a f totally ethical way. My big assumption. Do you, I mean before we move on past that point? Do you think they can? handle the data in the best possible way? Oh, no, not okay. even close. But let's, for the sake of argument, let's say they can. Okay. The Office of Personnel Management was hacked. All of the personnel records are huge numbers, uh, millions of personal records of government employees, including Social Security numbers, pensions, all of that information was taken. You've just created a database now of all of the business information and valuation for the entire country. You think that's not going to get hacked? So uh, even assuming the government is going to do its best job, they are not necessarily going to prevent that information from, from getting out. And while some people will argue, you, 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 know, you, you, shouldn't, ha you shouldn't hide from the government. I, I don't agree with that argument, but some people will make that argument. That doesn't necessarily mean you, your neighbors need to know everything about you. Um, if you have a, an LLC that owns a business you're, if you, and your neighbor can find it, now, that, now they know what, or can get a really good idea of what your net worth might be. They don't need to know that. Uh, they don't need to know that I have um, uh, a house uh, that I rent. They don't need to know um, that you know, somebody might own a private jet yeah. uh, or precisely how. Um, so all of this stuff, sh sure, the government can get it, but now there's going to be a push once this data is out there to just make it public. Yeah. I thought that we, the people, were supposed to be private citizens, and the government was supposed to be public. Yeah. So I thought we were supposed to know everything about them, and they don't know everything about us. Oh, yeah. That's not how it works now. That's not they, how it works. They, they want, uh, uh, you know, you get, uh, as, we, as we saw with Julian Assange and um, uh, uh, others, if you tell the truth, you get thrown in jail. So. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> So the KYC power grab is a honeypot. Uh, who knows uh, what they could do when they get that information, but 
Um, it's one of those things where it's like almost like nobody should concentrate that much knowledge and power. Yeah. Absolutely. There's just no, there's no upside. The, up, the upside almost seems nefarious in any way that you look at that in mm -hmm. a sense where the upside is, well, now they know or anybody could find out who has it so they could go get it. Mm -hmm. That's the upside. Yep. Right? <coughs> uh, and I suppose back if you're you know, super pro-government and pro-tax, then you might think that's a good thing. Um, but it also puts everybody into this, uh, everyone is guilty until proven innocent. Yep. Taxing, uh, they'll, they'll, they, they have it for the, the ability to, um, if, if they can seize your bank account, they can seize your real estate. They clearly can do that easily. Uh, they can't necessarily easily seize your Rolex, especially right. if they don't know it's there. But now right. if they know it, they can, like, you have Rolex, you registered it, bring us the Rolex. Yeah, um, although that's not on the docket right now. Not here. It That's is in the Europe. EU. It's a, yeah, uh, but once you once you have all of these um, these connections on the business side, you can start to look into that, uh, and it's it just a, it's a one way ratchet, right? Yeah. Um, we're just because of things like the First Amendment, we are a little bit, and the way our government is constructed in general, some of these stuff uh, that Europe is doing takes longer to do here, and you you have to move more slowly. But if you don't put your foot down on this, then you will get to the next step. Yeah. Yeah. And I know Wyoming, in which, you, which you work in the state of Wyoming, has been uh, with, with Caitlin Long and um, has been really sort of trying to be at the forefront of protecting asset mm -hmm. rights, right? So like the state has sort of tried to reinforce their right to control assets, specifically around Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies yep. uh, with like UCC filings mm -hmm. and saying, wait, hang on, these are assets, these are protected by the state. So I guess that's sort of this power struggle that you're talking about then. So the states are like, hey, these are our citizens in our state mm -hmm. and they have their assets here in this state and the Fed doesn't need to know about that. Then? Well, there's a couple of different things. Um, specifically with digital assets. Uh, at the moment, with the exception of Wyoming, if you have a digital asset, it exists everywhere and nowhere. So uh, there's, there's no functional legal nexus other than where you live. So if you live in New York, uh, New York's gonna say that asset is in New York. If you then move to Virginia, now New York can say, well, it was in New York, so we, have, we can control it. And Virginia's gonna say, well, you're here, so we can control it. Uh, that gets to be a, a problem, like with a car, once, if you if you move and you register it in Virginia, now it's in Virginia. Obviously, you can't physically move real estate, so that's always under the purview of whatever location it's in. With digital assets, it it could be anywhere. California, for instance, could say you've never been to California, but um, since it's on the internet and the internet runs through California, it's here. Uh, what Wyoming has done is said if you want to, you can register the asset in Wyoming, and that will. Uh, it's not been test in court, but under Wyoming law, that will mean that because you have elected that asset to be uh, domesticated in Wyoming, now that asset is in Wyoming, which means you can then take advantage of the Wyoming laws, one of which is you cannot be compelled to release your private key. So a court can issue you a charging order and say, you must, you must give us the money in the account, right? But they can't force you to disclose the private key uh, under Wyoming law. And that's, uh, that is very important because um, if you disclose the private key under Bitcoin, of course, if you, the master private key, now you know every single account that's in there, not just the ones that uh, they're doing a charging order for. Right. Um, and uh, that also means that you, you know, you've now burned that account in every sub account forever. So you, uh, that, that key is now in the public record. So you, you can't, if you ever receive anything to that account in the future, it could, it's just gonna get stolen. Right. So um, Wyoming does have that protection. We also have uh, some lien washing rules where if you, uh, if you receive something uh, that has a lien on it and it's in good faith, uh, the same way you would say if you uh, received a uh, physical good under the UCC, well, we've basically read that into digital assets in some ways. And of course, we're pushing the envelope on that as well. Yeah. How is that going? Uh, it's going pretty well. The, uh, uh, the digital asset registration went online officially uh, 1st of December, and we've had a, a few do it. Um, the, if you're a citizen of Wyoming, obviously you live there. There's not much necess not a need necessarily to do it. If you have an LLC in Wyoming and the asset is under the LLC, well, that LLC is a citizen of Wyoming. So 
this, uh, the reg registration is really for people who don't live in Wyoming and don't have a business in Wyoming, but want to domesticate their asset into Wyoming and basically uh, take advantage of Wyoming's laws without necessarily going through the process of forming a business or moving to Wyoming. Got it. So if you're, if you're a resident there or you uh, have a business there, then you're sort of already uh, just under yeah. that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're non-resident or non-registered business, then you would need to register the asset. If way. you want to take advantage of it, yeah. Got it, which is then still a big registry, a big honeypot. <laughs> it is. But, uh, and so you wouldn't necessarily register these assets um, uh, if you want them to be private, and there's no necessarily right. need to do that. But cer certain assets, like if the reason why you would do this intentionally, that, and that's really what, it's about choice, right? right. You, you should be allowed to choose to disclose or not personal details, and what you own is a personal detail. So if you were to, say, want to leverage an asset as collateral, then the bank is going to want to know a lot about that asset, such as, do you really own it? Where is it domesticated? Well, if you take that asset, um, let's, let's just say it's a, a Bitcoin public key, you register that public key, everything in that public key is now registered in Wyoming. We, we say that public key exists in Wyoming. The bank knows that that public key exists. You have registered it. You are on under oath. Uh, or you're uh, under penalty of perjury for filing the document saying that you own this. And now it's effectively a public record. Yeah. The bank has a little bit more uh, f concern that that's there. Yeah. So, so I, w I was working the news desk this morning and here at the, at the Bitcoin conference, and um, we were talking about politics. Trump speaking here later this week. Um, by the time people see this, uh, he'll have already spoken. RFK speaking, so it's not really partisan. We have people on both sides of the aisle. Not Kamala, she declined that <laughs> invitation. Um, but you know, one thing that I said on the news desk was that this is, you know, it's not that Bitcoin became political. Um, it's political in a sense only because money has become weaponized, and the dollar has been weaponized against uh, almost everyone in the in the world. Yeah. I mean, countries anyway. Um, and I said, it's not really that Bitcoin's on the ballot, it's that freedom's on the ballot. That's, that's the way that I say it, right? So mm -hmm. it's like the freedom to choose how we want to store our value, how we want to transact. That's what's really at stake, not Bitcoin per se, right? Yep. Um, but really sort of when I think about these types of things that you're, we're talking about here, it's really like freedom's on the, on the ballot, um, sovereignty is on the ballot, right? The, the ability for us to remain a private citizen, as I said, um, and the state, or I really actually in this case, like the government trying to take away our ability to be that private individual. Is that how you see it? Uh, yes. Uh, and the, to participate in the modern economy, you have to live with some removal of privacy. Just, you have IDs, you have, it just, it's just the way it is. The point is you should be able to choose how much you want to integrate with that. If you don't, if you don't ever leave your state, you don't want to, why do we need to know everything about you? Um, and there are certain times of your life that you may not want to be, to be fully integrated, and other times you may want to. So uh, people should be allowed to um, pick and choose how much integration that they have at any point in their life. In addition, um, there are certain legal activities that you may not want to have widely disclosed. Sure. Um, you know. It, tons of them. Tons of them. Like, I mean, that's just straight up Operation Choke Point, that kind of stuff. It's like, why do we need to know all of this stuff about you when these are perfectly legal activities? Uh, one of the analogies that I use uh, when people say, you know, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. I'm like, okay, fine. Then you're okay if the New York Times comes into your bedroom and films you um, with your partner. Yeah. Because you're not doing anything yeah. illegal. Or I would just your, say, give me your phone. Yeah. I mean, let, like, let me go through your phone. Exactly. Nobody's going to want that. <laughs> yeah. And so the, that, that, that argument of you, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear is, is, is crap. Yeah. But that is the primary argument for, well, we need to know everything about everybody so that if something does go wrong, we can find out who did it. I'm like, well, okay, there's a thing called police work. Right. Do it. Yeah. I mean. It's, it's the whole, it's the whole pre-crime thing. Yeah. Um, and, and really, you know, it's, it's constantly, we see it everywhere, um, inconveniencing everybody for potentially catching one or 2% of bad people. Yeah. Right. Where I live down uh, in Southern California, we have like, you know, immigration checkpoints, which I don't even know why we have them anymore. We just have the border open, but like, uh, you know, 
very often there's massive lines on the freeway and you have to wait because they have like a checkpoint going. Yep. It's like, I'm going to inconvenience everybody for that, right? Or in this KYC situation, maybe there's one or two pe people that will do something bad, but let's inconvenience everybody, put everybody at risk. Um, let's talk about um, another thing that's, that uh, was happening in uh, Wyoming and with Caitlin Long as well, which was Custodia Bank. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, We've seen the dangers of the banks. Uh, we, we understand, most people watching this understand that the banks are in, in great danger, partly because they were buying government bonds that are uh, no longer holding their value. We saw banks collapsing. And Custodia Bank tried to do something different, which would be like a full reserve bank, so they wouldn't be subject to the ups and downs of the bond market like other banks are. Um, seems like a pretty good idea. Like, the bank actually holds my money, so I can yeah. get it when I want. But yet, the Fed didn't like that. The Fed has a, uh, they have a lot of arguments as to why they, they don't want to grant Custodia a master account. And of course, the, the master account is the uh, first building block to having a real bank. Now, you, you can have a bank with a, what's called a correspondent account, and you can function. It is a, it's significantly more expensive. I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, Caitlin or other banker, uh, bankers could get into precisely how much more expensive and why that is. But without a master account, you're not a first-class citizen of the banking system. Similarly, if you're not running a node, you're not a first-class citizen of the Bitcoin system. Uh, that is effectively your a master account. Means you have your own account with the Fed. Exactly. So that you, 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 if your bank effectively can clear directly with the Fed. Right. Um, the the Fed doesn't want to grant Custodia a master account for a couple of different reasons. Their stated reason. I think one of their more uh, later stated reasons was Custodia doesn't have FDIC insurance. Well, we know that's uh, not really, uh, that, that's a red herring because there's several hundred banks that have master accounts that don't have FDIC insurance mm, really? that are not fully reserved. Okay. So they're running bare. Um, there are uh, other reasons why they've said this, but fundamentally they don't want to give Custodia a master account because Custodia is potentially a risk to them. If you have a fully reserved bank, you can't have a run on your bank because if you if you put a thousand dollars in the bank, the bank has a thousand dollars. They haven't lent it out. Under in Custodia's case, it's a violation of state law for them to lend out that money. So they have it on their balance sheet and can immediately return it to you. Um, the problem is, like, look at Silicon Valley Bank. A whole bunch of businesses that never had a relationship with Silicon Valley Bank got into uh, financial trouble when Silicon Valley Bank went down because a lot of the fintechs were routing their payrolls through Silicon Valley Bank. And mm -hmm. so the moment they went down, some of these payrolls were in flight. Well, you know, little, uh, little mom and pop that's running their payroll with, with a uh, uh, fintech company that happens to have their payroll in flight when the bank goes under and the payroll doesn't get to their employees. Well, they didn't have a relationship with, uh, uh, with SVB, so uh, they suddenly got impacted. Well, if, right. they're, if that mezzanine bank that was handling these payrolls was Custodia, and Custodia had a problem, all that money is still there. So yeah. it, wouldn't have a, it couldn't have a run on the bank. Right. So at that point, as a small business owner, what do you think? Do you think you want to have your uh, payroll being, being run through a bank that could fail or a bank that can't fail? I would like the can't fail. Exactly. Yeah. So fundamentally, the risk that they're not going to say out loud, but the, the risk to the system is that Custodia is too safe and it, uh, it puts stress on the rest of the system, which, of course, um, it, it, it's, it remains to be seen it's a, it's, it, if, if that will actually happen um, because Custodia, as a, the way they have to make money is they have to charge fees. So their fees are going to be um, you know, significantly higher than someone who can basically give you a free checking account uh, because they're making all their scratch on uh, lending out the money. Of course, J.P. Morgan just said that they're getting rid of free checking. So, even so, so you're saying the Fed um, declined Custodia's bank, a full reserve bank that should be a lot less risky, they declined it because it is less risky. I think that's. I think that played a role. I'm not sure if that's the entire and, reason. And obviously, to the listener, they're scratching their heads. Mm -hmm. So they're saying, "Well, why would they decline it because it's less risky?" Because it because it damages the Fed's uh, fractional reserve system. So what you're saying is, it makes every all the other banks look so bad. Yeah. that everybody might want to come to Custodia, which would then cause a massive run on all the other banks. Exactly. 
Uh, potentially. Uh, potentially. The potentially. flip side is, is that the question is, we don't know, will people accept less risk and pay higher for it monthly? Yep. We don't know that. We don't know we that. We can't know that. That's and what the free market would figure out. Exactly. And another reason I think that the Fed is uh, going after or preventing Custodia from getting a master account is, uh, and this is the argument that uh, a couple of individuals have made in the Custodia case, uh, including the Wyoming Secretary of State, which is, the Federal Reserve wants to pull back on the dual banking system, which is right now the U.S. has a dual banking system where there are federally chartered banks and state chartered banks. And these banks are supposed to be on a completely level playing field with respect to access to the Fed. I think they don't like this. I think they want to effectively remove this system from existence and they want everything to become a federally chartered bank because they, the, uh, the, the, they don't have full visibility, they don't have full regulatory control over what some of the state banks can do. The state uh, of Wyoming, the state of Virginia, the state of New York does have full regulatory control over the state chartered banks, but their bank regulators can't touch the federally chartered banks. So uh, you basically are effectively having a battle of two regulatory visions, or, no or four, uh, 51 regulatory visions. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. No different than what we were just talking about. Uh, it's a state versus Fed mm -hmm. constantly. Um, let's talk. Uh, let's talk the bigger political picture here. So um, again, uh, here we are at the Bitcoin conference. Uh, Trump and RFK are speaking. A little bipartisan. Kamala was invited to attend. She didn't attend, and you know we can speculate as to why. But um, I'm curious your take on this and what's on the, what's at stake here. Um, the Biden regime has been openly hostile mm -hmm. to Bitcoin through, you mentioned earlier, Choke Point, choke, choke point 2.0. Um, um, Elizabeth Warren on the Biden regime has been openly running an anti-crypto uh, platform or campaign. Um, President Biden himself vetoed a bill mm -hmm. that would have allowed the banks to custody um, crypto assets. So it's like not just the regime, but Biden even himself, supposedly, he did. His office vetoed a bill. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm curious your take on sort of what's at stake for the digital asset for Bitcoin space, you know, uh, on this election. The, well, clearly the, the uh, RFK, uh, so the independent candidate and the Republicans uh, have decided. I think of RFK as an independent candidate, obviously he's running independent, but mm -hmm. he's a Democrat. He is, yeah. And, um, I, and, I, I, and I just want to reinforce that point because it's not about Trump or Republicans or mm -hmm. Democrats. I mean, RFK is a Democrat. He's a lifelong Democrat. His family's yeah. a lifelong Democrat. He's running on the independent only because he has to, because they wouldn't allow him. But anyway, sorry. Yeah, and that's a good point. Um, but th those candidates, they've seen the writing on the wall. They know uh, that this is where we're going. And they don't, neither one of them, uh, believe in CBDCs for probably very different philosophical reasons, but it gets them to the same place. Um, Elizabeth Warren is on record as saying she wants a CBDC. Uh, I, 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 whether we want it or not. Whether we want it or not. She literally said, I'm there, I'm ready, ready to go with a CBDC. Uh, and the only way you get to a CBDC in this country is if you consolidate the power, you, you eliminate the state banks, you move everything to the federal chartered banks, and then you slowly remove those too and uh, consolidate all the power into the Federal Reserve. So that's, 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 the, that's how you end up getting one. So <clears throat> what, that, <clears throat> what that looks like for the, uh, the, the country long term, the conflict of visions, is if you have someone like Kamala who gets elected as president, uh, basically the continuation of the, of the Biden regime, you probably still have Elizabeth Warren, even though uh, the, the, the Harris campaign has made a couple of half-hearted overtures. I don't believe that, I don't, and I don't think any, uh, any uh, Bitcoiner would believe that that's friendship. That's, you know, we see that you all are a, a power broker now. We have to play lip service. But uh, I don't think that that goes anywhere. So if she were to be elected, I see that we're just going to get more of the same, possibly even uh, more uh, you know, pedal to the metal on it because uh, they will they, they will have a limited time frame to do it. Yeah. Um, does this mean that the Republicans uh, and or RFK are good? No. It just means they're better. But 
on certain things. On certain things. Yeah. For this, for the purposes of Bitcoin. Right. For now, and you know that could change on the dime. Yeah. They could, but uh, f they they at least understand it. They they are uh, com currently philosophically opposed to what a uh, what Elizabeth Warren's vision is, and that means that we are uh, aligned for now on this issue. This, it's not necessarily going to last forever. I, I hope it does, and I hope that the uh, that the Democrats who understand that the CBDC is a bad thing uh, win out, and that uh, if Kamala is somehow elected president, that it goes. Uh, that you know that, that she's moderated on some of these issues, and Elizabeth Warren's faction is is you know, minimized. But if that were to happen, there's much I, I have a lot, much less faith that that that's the way it will play out. Well, I would also think, or do you think that um, if Kamala were to win, that it would actually show that their side is more desirable, that their side has won. Um, the pro-Bitcoin candidates, the, the RFK and Trump lost. Mm -hmm. So people must want more regulation and must want a CBDC. I think, <clears throat> I think that that is a, um, uh, that is a, that will be used as a justification. Absolutely. Do I people think? People spoke. Yeah. Look. But I, as you know, in any federal election, there are thousands of issues at play. Um, yes, the people spoke, but can you say that Harris won because of her, uh, and Trump lost, and RFK lost because of their differential support on this issue? Probably not, but it will be used as that. Yeah. Um, well, history's written by the victors. So. Exactly. And, you know, there's, 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 you know, a dozen or more issues that uh, could decide the election, but that just means that they're going to say, we have a mandate on every single one of these issues, not, oh, wait, this is the one that mattered. What do you think will be the top issues that would decide the election? Well, you have uh, uh, yeah, the, the spending in Ukraine, the, uh, the, the inflation that, that uh, um, well, I mean, that, that Biden has uh, caused and others, but uh, uh, the, the spending on that, the abortion decision at the Supreme Court, uh, that's going to be used considerably. I think there's a, a lot of anger from how uh, COVID turned out. Um, and basically, there's what was kind of exposed pretty plainly is uh, a, a level of incompetence at the federal level, uh, specifically with the Secret Service and their, and their handling of uh, the Trump rally a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so things like that are, I believe, going to play a large role. Will that tip it toward one or another? Um, I don't know, I, I, but I think that uh, uh, the, the Democrats move to eliminate Biden from the ticket and put uh, Harris up as their dominant candidate. I think that uh, it was the only move they had left at the time. It's all speculation, we don't know. Some people are saying that uh, uh, some of the inner rumblings from the DNC are that um, Biden threw that out of throwing Kamala on there and just messed up the whole program. And that's not what Obama wanted. And um, it was not their hope. And now they're stuck with it yeah. trying to figure out what to do with that. Um, but uh, yeah, I would say those are probably some of the issues. I think the inflation issue, specifically just the cost of living issue, which is an inflation issue, I think is, is probably, I would guess, maybe most front and center of everybody's mind. The problem is that they've sort of, um, you know, they changed the definition of what inflation mm -hmm. is. Now it's CPI, consumer price inflation, and then we don't know what causes prices to go up and down. So it's probably hard to pinpoint that on on somebody. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think the, the 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 public data is horribly manipulated. Everybody, or most people, understand that. What people do get is, I go to the store. It's costing me two, three x what it used to. Right. Uh, that video that went around uh, recently of the uh, of the, the individual that had a uh, like a pre-order uh, like Walmart or Amazon or whatever from years ago, and then just hit reorder, and it was four x. Wow. Uh, same items, four x. Wow. Or three x. So like, but a real uh, basket of goods. Yeah, and you know. The CPI is the CPI. They, we know they manipulate it. They've been manipulating it since it was formed to give the answer that they want it to give. But you can't manipulate the 
you know, the actual feeling of people at the grocery store. Yeah. And fundamentally, I think that's, that is the issue in my mind that's going to resolve this election is the pain that people are feeling at the grocery store when they're trying to feed their families. And that uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, talk and education that Bitcoin has done, even if you know, a lot, uh, large chunks of society aren't ready to go as far as we did, Mainstream, they're talking about the dollar is fiat. That was us. Yeah. Like, they're talking about inflation. People understand that it's the printing that's doing it. Uh, they may not understand how it works out, but you know, our, our education of people has been so successful that the MMTers had to come out with their little movie, which, if you watched, was kind of hilariously uh, opaque as to what's actually happening. But at some point in there, they did basically admit that it's video game money. Yeah. So we just make it up. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't mention border security. I didn't mention border security. Um, I happen to live in, a, in an area where we're pretty far from it, but I, that is another big issue. Uh, and um, I, I don't know how much of an issue that'll play because that issue is already so heavily polarized between the two sides. I don't know if that issue is going to be the deciding issue because I think that... Uh, uh, I th some people will change their mind. I just don't know if that's the dominant issue that will swing the election one way or the other because uh, I think people are already pretty set on that. I think the, uh, the inflation issue and... and I think even if you were a strong Democrat and you lived in, let's say, New York, yeah. where in Manhattan, and not just Manhattan, the boroughs, Bronx, et cetera, rapes are up 300%. Mm -hmm. Does that I think yeah. even if you're a lifelong Democrat and you see you're not safe in your own neighborhood anymore, you probably want those borders closed. And if, even if it's the other party that's offering to close the borders, maybe that swings you. I agree that you will swing people, but will that swing uh, the Electoral College? Like, are you going to move New York from blue to red? Yeah. Now, what I, what I could see happening is that that issue and other issues like it swing it so that if, say, Kamala wins, it may be the first time uh, that the Democratic candidate has won without the popular vote. That, I see, is potentially possible. And then you, then you have the uh, inconvenient truth of them saying, well, the national popular vote should decide the president. But Which is what Hillary tried to say. Yep. Yeah. So is that on the table? I think that could be on the table for just that reason. I just don't see, I don't see the border issue as a strong enough issue to switch a, uh, maybe a state like North Carolina, maybe a state uh, that's, that's uh, you know, fairly on the bubble, sure, but not like in New York not like California, the states where they, you know, they're, they're in Texas, of course, is already quite red. So uh, I think that the, the border issue, I don't know if it's going to, if it's, if it's strong Arizona. enough. Yeah. Maybe that well, Arizona and Nevada. Those, two, those are two states that, that could, that could flip flop because of that. But <clears throat> taken together, I think, uh, I think the Democrats have a fairly tough road to hoe. Yeah. Row to hoe. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I think we covered a lot of ground. I think um, I'm going to continue just saying I think freedom's on the on the on the docket here. Uh, the freedom to be sovereign, the freedom mm -hmm. to choose, the freedom to open a bank that doesn't uh, cause any more risk. Um, so I don't I don't think people should be single issue voters because I think you need to kind of look at the whole big picture. But you've laid out the risks I think pretty well. So I think we'll wrap it up with that. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Cheers. Right.